Welcome to the How to Start Taking Insurance in Your Psychiatry Practice event. Today, we'll cover a high-level overview of insurance billing and the healthcare industry and offer insights and tips for successfully submitting claims and getting paid. My name is Sarah McGuire. I am the community manager uh, and marketing manager here at OzMind. For those of you who, who don't know about the host of today's webinar, uh, OzMind is an EHR and premier technology platform in the breakthrough mental health treatment space. To learn more about OzMind, please visit OzMind.org. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Carlene so she can introduce herself and then uh, speak to some of these results. All right. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. I uh, applaud your eagerness to learn more about insurance. So a little about me. Uh, my name is Carly McMillan. I am the chief medical officer at OzMind, as well as a practicing um, adult child and interventional psychiatrist. Um, pertinent for today's talk um, is that I'm also the co-chair of the Clinical TMS Society's Insurance Committee. Um, and I personally have been taking insurance in one way or the other for the past decade across a variety of practice settings. That's everything from when I had a very small solo practice back in Boston to a large group uh, multidisciplinary practice here in New York. And then finally, what I have now, which is a, a smaller interventional psychiatry practice. Um, so really kind of seen it all in the space. Um, and recently also um, co-authored with Brain Futures, a CPT coding guide for psychedelic medicine. So kind of live and breathe, thinking about insurance billing, CPT codes, all of that. Um, and look forward to sharing with you today stuff I've learned over the past decade, and hopefully some of the mistakes I've made you will not. You can learn from uh, the wisdom, and I'm always happy to learn from you guys as well. So um, if you have a pressing question, um, something I'm saying is not at all making sense, please feel free to put it in the chat um, during the talk. Um, and if you have a more kind of additional detailed type of question, we will get to questions at the end and you can put it in the chat as well. Um, so just looking at who's here uh, today, um, so it looks like most of you are kind of still in that starting out space, uh, which is great. Hopefully for the more advanced crowd, we'll still have some tips here and there, some clinical pearls. Um, but for those that are just getting started out, I hope it's going well. And for those that are thinking about it or planning to, hopefully this will give you uh, a groundwork to start from. All right, so we're going to briefly talk about just some basic insurance vocabulary, talk about how to set up a panel and credential with payers, how do you actually submit a claim once you're on a panel, how do you get paid, what happens if you don't, um, and then just briefly at the end, we'll talk a little bit about Ozmine's uh, solution to uh, processing claims through our EHR. All right. So um, I know there's a lot on this slide, and we have two vocabulary slides because I actually think taking insurance um, and entering this world is very much like visiting a foreign country where you do not speak the language um, and it can get overwhelming very, very quickly. Um, so wanted to spend some time just on some terms that I'll be using throughout the talk, um, some acronyms. So the first one, insurance credentialing and contracting, that is, of course, the process of applying to insurance companies. That's the credentialing part. And then the contracting part is actually working with them, sometimes negotiating with them around uh, the terms of the contract and the rates. Um, enrollment, this is a little where people get a little confused. Enrollment is actually once you're already credentialed and on a panel with a payer, enrollment is when you actually get set up with a clearinghouse. A clearinghouse is what you use to submit claims um, that, that, that you basically are saying, hey, clearinghouse, I'm over here. I've credentialed with Blue Cross and I would like to submit my claims through you. I've chosen you. That's what enrollment means. Um, and so it's not synonymous with credentialing. Um, the fee schedule, those are going to be your contracted rates, um, oftentimes known as allowed amounts with the specific payer. Um, Eligibility check, um, also called verification of benefits or VOV. Um, this is the process by which uh, you'll check to see what types of, um, not only does the patient have active insurance coverage, but what do their benefits look like for the services that they're gonna be getting with you. Um, includes all those fun things, co-payments, co-insurance, deductibles, et cetera. Um, so speaking of which, uh, most people you know, have insurance, under, are familiar at least with the concept of a deductible. 
usually there's an in-network deductible and an out-of-network deductible. So you want to be looking if you're in-network with an insurance at that patient's in-network deductible and whether or not it applies to mental health. Sometimes it does not. Um, a copay also, usually uh, people will have a, a primary care copay and then a specialist copay. Um, you want to look in the mental health section because sometimes payers will treat uh, mental health like the primary care and they'll have a lower copay. And sometimes they use the specialist copay. There doesn't seem to be a ton of rhyme or reason. So you have to figure out which one and hopefully it will break it down on the, on the sheet. Um, and then coinsurance, I think is really the biggest misnomer. Um, coinsurance basically means um, what the patient is responsible for after um, the insurance has paid their, their portion. Um, and usually it's a percentage of the allowed amount. Um, it suggests they might have other coverage, but most people do not. Uh, most people with commercial coverage do not have two commercial plans. Um, when you get into the Medicare space, people do tend to have that secondary coverage. Um, but for the most part, when you see coinsurance, just swap that out with amount patient is going to owe. Patients really don't understand this oftentimes as well. So you have to do a lot of kind of explaining. Um, OON is just stands for out of network. You'll see OON and INN, which is in network. Um, so out of network just means you're not in network with that um, particular, particular plan. Um, and so you can basically charge them whatever your standard rates are. All right, moving on. So those are all the kind of getting started terms. Now they're all the terms for within the clearinghouse. And this is where there's a ton of acronyms. So just bear with me. Um, EDI is a term that stands for electronic data interchange. Basically just a platform to do claim stuff. So clearinghouses like Change, Office Alley, Availity, these are all examples of EDI service providers. So sometimes you'll see this term mentioned and that they really just mean clearinghouse. Um, the process of claim scrubbing um, to submit what's known as a clean claim um, basically is an, is an automated process whereby when you go to submit something, you can verify first and the system will check and make sure it's not missing anything or doesn't have any red flags in it that would be like, oh my gosh, you forgot to put a diagnosis or you forgot to put who the rendering provider was. It'll flag it and say, you know what, I don't think you should submit this. And most modern systems do a pretty good job scrubbing the claim so that it submits what's called a clean claim onto the payer. Because what you don't want is a claim to be submitted, it goes through the process and then it gets to the payer and then the payer says, hold up, you forgot this one little box to check and we're going to send it right back. So this is a really crucial step. Um, I think it's kind of funny. It's called scrubbing, but what, what have you. Um, claim adjudication basically just means the insurance company has essentially uh, worked through the claim and adjudicated and determined what do they owe and what does the, um, what does the, the patient owe. Um, and they're going to convey that information back to you. Um, but that, that's what they call that process of adjudication. It's essentially claim processing. Um, EFT stands for electronic fund transfer. So most of us probably really don't want to get paper checks in the mail or the worst is this gift card like thing that some of these pairs will send. It's like a credit card and you don't want that. Um, you really want to sign up for EFT when you enroll with a payer. So once you're enrolled, usually they'll tell you to go to a website and sign up for EFT where you give your bank account information, cancel check or a bank letter, um, and then the money will just flow directly into your bank account. This is the goal. Um, just to call out that even when you do this, like let's say for example, um, credentialed with Cigna or Evernorth, um, for the vast majority of Cigna, I'm gonna get that check directly into my bank account um, with no effort on my part. But sometimes people have like an employer-based version or something like that, and it's like an odd version. And so occasionally I'll get a check in the mail as well from like another variation of Cigna. Um, that's going to be unavoidable, um, but for the most part, you have the majority of your stuff going directly into your bank account. Um, ERA means electronic remittance advice. So this is gonna be what comes back after the claim is adjudicated. Um, it's gonna show in your system uh, what has been paid by the payer and what the patient is still responsible for. It'll also show any type of error codes or anything like that that shows you, you know, something wasn't paid. Maybe you need to fix it. Maybe it's just 
how it is and not gonna pay for something that's not covered. Um, and then similarly, an EOB, that is what the patient gets. So I'm sure everyone that's gotten medical services, they get this EOB in the mail and it's usually a very cryptic document from the payer that tries to explain in common language what happened, uh, but patients will uh, get these and have questions. It's essentially the same as an ERA, but for patients. Um, balance billing, really important to understand that balance billing is when, let's say I'm contracted for um, $100 for a, a medical management visit, just made up number, hopefully they're paying you more than that. Um, and the patient has a $20 copay. Now let's say in my private practice, I normally charge $200. If I get the claim back, and they paid me $80, and they say a patient has a $20 copay, then I need to pay, have the patient pay $20. I can't balance bill them, which would be charging them the difference between my private pay rate and my insurance rate. That is not allowed by insurance contracts. And some people I've seen, unfortunately, do that. You can get into a lot of trouble for that. It's, I think, technically through a form of insurance fraud. So don't do that. Don't balance bill. If you're contracted, you have to take that rate. If you're out of network, totally different ball game. You can balance bill all day long for the difference between what they get reimbursed and your current rate. But if you're once you're in, in network, you take what they take what they get. Um, and then finally, uh, write off. Um, so write off is basically the difference between what insurance paid, what the patient is supposed to pay, and what is uh, left afterwards. Now it could be that you tried to collect a copay and the patient has ghosted you and their card doesn't run and you don't really want to send them to collections, so you're going to write off that $20. You've made every effort. Or it could be that when you submitted the claim, you just put your private practice rate. You put that $200 instead of $100. And of course, you're not going to get that full $200. So you're going to write off the rest. You're going to write off the $100 that neither the patient nor the insurance is going to pay you. So that's something that you should be built into systems. That's what it means. Um, it's really technically only a, a true write-off if it was something you were for tax purposes, if you were something that you were expected to get and did not. Um, if you're just inflating your rates, then it's not a true write-off. Um, so this is a good question. Can a balance billing agreement state the practice can bill for non-covered services? Yes. So basically, this is this really comes up quite a bit actually in the ketamine and interventional space. So you can be credentialed with a given insurance. And with that insurance company, you're obligated to um, treat the patient with covered services using that contract. But if you offer a service that is not covered by the insurance, you are free to bill them whatever you want, whatever your customary rates are for those uncovered services. So like an example in my practice, I do standard once a day TMS covered by insurance. And then I also do accelerated TMS with multiple per day, which insurance doesn't pay for. So if I have a patient with Cigna, once a day, paid for. If that patient sees me for full day of TMS, not paid for. That is allowed. That's not. That's different than than balance billing. Um, the patient isn't going to be able to submit those claims towards their out of network benefits. They will get rejected. So whatever is not covered is just fully not covered. Um, so hopefully that answers your your question. And that does happen a lot for these sort of hybrid practices that are doing a, a mix of covered and un and non-covered services. It would be same like if you went to, you know, a dermatologist, the mole is covered by insurance, but the, you know, the Botox to not have wrinkles is, is not, right? S same idea. Um, if the insurance company does not consider it medically nece necessary and it's not in your contract, then that's fine. Um, and I think that's actually like a really good thing too, because you can take insurance and you can still be private pay. Like you can do a combination of both as long as you're just mindful of what is covered by whom. All right, next slide. All right, so um, let's say you've now decided that you wanna memorize all those terms and start taking insurance. Um, we're gonna talk briefly about uh, which ones you should consider taking. Um, how do you credential? Should you outsource credentialing and or billing? Um, and then a little bit around how you might be able to negotiate that fee schedule in the contract. Okay, so there are four main types of insurance that typically people think about whether or not to take. The first is traditional Medicare. Um, so this is for folks 65 or older or people with certain disabilities, um, like 
I actually take Medicare, um, not because I work with a more geriatric population, but because I actually do work with a number of people on psychiatric um, and medical disability. Um, and I want to be able to help those folks. And so, you know, Medicare covers them. Um, these rates are set um, by CMS. Um, they vary regionally. You can look them up online. You can look them up by code online. Uh, there is no negotiation. This is typically the sort of moderate benchmark rate that you're going to measure everything to. So even if you don't take Medicare, it behooves you to understand these rates because when you get a fee sheet back from a commercial payer, you want to compare it. Like, are they paying you less than Medicare? Because if not, that's not cool. If they're paying you a percentage more than Medicare, then you're in the right neighborhood, right? To accepting contracts underneath Medicare for a commercial payer is really a sign that that contract is probably not optimized for you. Um, Medicaid, these are for uh, low income and certain families, some children, things like that. Um, this is a state-based plan. Typically, these are lower than traditional Medicare, and there is no negotiation. So typically about 70% of the Medicare rates. Um, I typically think taking Medicaid is a little bit more of an advanced step. Um, it's a great thing for your community, but if you're just starting out in billing insurance land, there are a lot of regulations, and they tend to not um, pay as reliably just due to some technical issues and things like that. So I would say that's more of an advanced thing. Maybe don't start don't start there. Um, commercial insurance, of course, that's the, you know, Cigna, Aetna, Blue Cross, um, United, all of those things. These are private commercial plans. These vary widely. What they pay, even like a Blue Cross in New Jersey and a Blue Cross in Massachusetts, the way that they interact with their people that are contracted with them can be quite different. Um, the rates, the ease of use, all of that um, really is quite payer and region specific. Um, typically, you're going to be seeing rates that are about 120 to 180% of Medicare. Um, if you're well above that, awesome. Uh, if you're well below that, not awesome. Um, and a quick note here about Medicare. So this has come up more and more, but traditional Medicare, these people have a card that is very, it's very simple looking and it's red, white, and blue. That's traditional Medicare. More and more people have Medicare Advantage plans. Sometimes they do not understand that they have signed up for that and they do not know what it means. And they will tell you, yes, I have Medicare. And then you see their card and it says United on it. That's Medicare Advantage. So Medicare Advantage is when a commercial payer has essentially contracted with Medicare to manage that plan. And it's quite a different structure. And unfortunately, unless you're credentialed with that commercial payer and specifically their Medicare Advantage line of business, you can't take that. So like if you take regular Medicare and a Medicare Advantage person that has a Cigna flavor um, comes in, like even if you're credentialed with Cigna, you may not be credentialed for the Medicare Advantage. So it's an important thing to keep in mind um, and especially if you have like a front desk staff or someone that's checking this for you, they oftentimes can get tripped up on this. They also, patients will get tripped up between the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. I can't tell you how often patients have called our office and said, oh yes, I have Medicare. And then it's a Medicaid plan, right? So in patients' minds, oftentimes, you know, it's very confusing. These terms are used interchangeably. So you always, always, always have to look at that insurance card for yourself and feel confident that it is what you think it is and it is something that you accept or you will get burned. Um, finally, there is TRICARE. This is the military plan. Um, it is uh, pretty aligned with Medicare rates. Um, I don't know as much about this. I've only worked with this on a handful of occasions. Um, doesn't come up so often in my region, but in some regions it's quite prevalent and I know people do enjoy working with it. Um, if, it, if it's pre prevalent in your region, but it's not going to be something that you negotiate rates. All right, uh, next slide. Um, so now that you kind of know the different flavors, um, when you're starting out, the strategy matters. Um, so if you're just starting out, I've seen people get really overwhelmed by trying to get paneled with like 10 different payers. I would not recommend that. If you're new to this, I would say you need to dip your toe in the water before you can swim. And to pick just one or two, um, or maybe like Medicare and one commercial, something like that, just to kind of get, get a sense of whether or not this is something you like to do. Um, how do you pick those one or two? 
Uh, well, sometimes it's really just convenience. So we were first starting out. Um, my husband was moonlighting at a local hospital and uh, we had our private practice. We were private pay and we saw, saw a patient. The patient submitted their super bill for out-of-network reimbursement to Cigna. Cigna comes back and says, oh, no, no, this doctor is in network. We're like, what do you mean he's in network? Well, he was in network for his other job. This is a very common scenario for people in private practice who have other jobs and they're juggling both things. If you are credentialed through your hospital system for major payers, you should know that some of those payers don't care where you practice. They see you as in network everywhere. Most aren't like that. Cigna is like that. United is not like that. Um, but you want to check because it may be that you're already in network and you just don't even know it. Um, if you are, you do have to talk to the uh, payer to make sure that they have your tax ID for your private practice, but that technically you're already there. And at that point, you can either decide, uh, you know, give up that moonlighting gig for your credentials, stop seeing patients with that payer in your practice if you don't want to deal with insurance, or say, you know what, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to try this out. Um, and that's what we did many years ago. And it, you know, worked out great. Um, so Sometimes it just happens like that. Uh, how it happened originally, a decade or so, how, how I got into, I think it was Blue Cross and Aetna at the time. I had a couple patients that I had been seeing since training. I wanted to continue seeing them in my residency clinic. We took insurance. It was lovely. Get to private practice, no insurance. Um, and these are patients where basically they may stop seeing you and go back to that resident clinic. Or they may be paying you at a very reduced fee. Um, and that reduced fee, you know, I know we're very generous and we want to be really helpful. Sometimes our reduced fees get really, really low and way lower than what insurance would actually pay you. So at some point you do the math and say, you know what, it would actually be better for the patient um, to have that low copay. And I would actually get paid more if I took insurance. So sometimes if you find you have a couple of patients like that, that may be a good payer to start with. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of how it, it sort of organically happens. The other uh, way is to look at how many covered lives they have. We have a, a blog post, uh, that's, uh, going to be sent out to attendees, I believe, um, that will show the covered lives for different regions for different payers. Um, and obviously you'd want to look at what's prevalent in your area. Um, you can also ask around. So ask your colleagues. Um, about payers that they like to work with, payers they feel reimbursed well and reliably. Um, but please note, you're really not supposed to be discussing specific rates with other clinicians. Um, there have been legal actions taken regarding this process of um, carteling. Essentially, sounds very silly, but there is a, a concern that clinicians getting together trying to like negotiate these other rates could happen. And it starts off very, very innocently. So like even in our Osmine practice community, we say, please don't share specific rates. That's why. But you can generally get a sense, like if somebody says, oh, you know what? Aetna is a really strong payer in my region. I highly recommend working with them. You don't need to know the exact rate. Um, and then finally, for those of us that are in the more interventional psychiatry space, doing things like TMS and S-ketamine, um, you may decide who you're going to go and network with based on how favorable their TMS and S-ketamine coverage is. For example, plug for Cigna or Evernorth, um, you know, they do cover OCD um, for TMS and many, many uh, payers do not. So for us, that was an easy choice to, to work with them um, around that. And if somebody has a more draconian uh, TMS or S-ketamine policy or doesn't cover it at all, and you're really passionate about those services, probably not a payer to excitedly get, uh, get into. Um, so a question that I will get to, I think, in the chat, because I imagine some other people's mind, um, is uh, what if the hospital takes Medicare and Medicaid, my private practice does not? Um, so with Medicare, you do um, need to assign benefits to, uh, like, it's not going to automatically translate over to a private practice. Same with Medicaid. Like, it is going to be specific to a tax ID. If you're already credentialed with Medicare for another gig, it's really easy to just add your practice um, to, to that panel on like the PCOS website. If you really don't wanna take it in your private practice though, there is like a form you have to have patients fill out saying that like they're not gonna, um, they're not gonna build Medicare and they understand what they're doing and everyone kind of knows. So it, it is a process. 
Some people will just fully opt out of Medicare altogether if they want nothing to do with it. But for Medicaid, don't don't worry about it. It doesn't it doesn't translate to your private practice. Um, and then how can you tell if someone has a Medicare Advantage plan or a Medicaid plan? So Medicare cards look exactly the same across the country. They are black and they're I mean a white card, red, white, and blue, black lettering. Like once you know, once you've seen one, you've seen all of them. That's what they look like. If the card is anything other than that, it is not a straight Medicare plan. Medicare Advantage plans will very much look more like your commercial insurance plan. Um, and then people oftentimes who have Medicare will have a secondary coverage. So they may show two cards, right? They'll show you that nice little red, white, and blue card and some other card. And the other card could be Blue Cross and you might not be in network with Blue Cross. That's okay. With Medicare, it's sort of magical. Whatever their secondary coverage is, you magically accept. Medicare processes the claim, they forward it onto that secondary carrier and they pay it. It's really odd, but that's how it happens. So I don't, if someone comes to me and they have the magic red, white, and blue Medicare card and a Medicaid plan, that's okay. I can take that. If they just have the Medicaid card, I can't take that because I don't take Medicaid. Um, so yeah, we can, uh, we can move on, but these are all good questions. All right. So once you've picked your payers that you want to credential with, um, the timeline for this is typically uh, like 90 to 150 days. You'll see um, things like Alma and Headway offering like a faster credentialing process. Those are limited to patients you see through Alma or Headway, and they have what's called delegated credentialing, meaning it doesn't follow you. If you were to leave that service, you would not still be credentialed. Um, and it's, a, it's sort of a limited type of credential. It's not a bad credential. It's just very different than if you're doing it directly with your private practice, which tends to take a little bit longer. But we'll, if you then go to a different private practice or you go to a hospital or something like that, you'll be fully credentialed with the, with the payer. Um, when you go to credential, you have to um, figure out if you're credentialing as an individual or if you have a group practice as a group. Um, some payers will give both options. Others won't give an option to join as a group contract unless you reach a certain critical mass. So for the most part, uh, people are going to be starting to credential just as an individual provider. Um, and it could be under, it'll be under the practices ID, however, their tax ID, but it will be under your NPI. And if, if you have, you know, two clinicians in your group, it's going to be same tax ID, two different NPIs, two different credentialing packets. Whereas if you have, you know, 10 people, you can do that kind of all at once as a group application and then individuals will get added to that through their own credentialing process. Um, if it's a group, it's a type two NPI. If it's just you as a provider, you don't need that type two NPI. You're just gonna use the regular NPI that you, you have. Um, one thing that's gonna be really essential for um, everything I think except for like Medicare, Medicaid is a CAQH profile. Now, the CAQH profile may be something that many of you have completed for other hospital gigs, moonlighting, things like that. Um, and so the hospital may have started one for you. If you go to the CAQ website and click like forget password, et cetera, you can figure out if you have one or not. They're free to create um, and you either will need to complete one for scratch or uh, reattest. I think it's like every 90 or 120 days, something like that, they send a ton of emails. And you basically, what it is, it's, it's a repository of all your information. Where did you go to residency? Are there any gaps in this training? All your malpractice coverage, all of that. You're gonna keep it there. It's gonna live there. You're gonna have to send it all again, identically to these people anyways. It's sort of like state licensure, like they'll use it. You're gonna have to duplicate your work, but it is one place where all of this stuff lives. And it's, it's completely free, but it is essential. And the more that you can get that done, in advance, the better. It is kind of time consuming to go through and fill it out. Um, another kind of pro tip is if you are entering into the credentialing process and your license for that state is like expiring in 30 days or your malpractice policy is about to expire, just renew it now. It's kind of like a passport. Like you're not supposed to travel if your passport's about to expire. So get those things done early before you begin that process because it will hold things up later. Um, do not sign the contract until you see the fee schedule. I've seen some things. I have seen a payer just 
send that hello sign my way, Dr. Stein, my way to sign. And I haven't seen what those rates are. And they say they're going to show them afterwards. Um, they say you can negotiate afterwards. No, 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 no. Do not sign until you see those rates, unless you really do not care what they are. Because once you sign for the next one to two years, those are going to be the rates that you're stuck with. So please insist on signing them, uh, getting those rates before you sign. And unfortunately, they don't, like you can't call up the payer and say, hey, what are your rates to decide? You actually have to jump through all the hoops and go through the credentialing process to see, uh, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, which is those rates. So I have definitely gone through the process more than once of going through all the credentialing only to get a fee sheet that was completely unacceptable. And then you've just kind of wasted all that time. Hopefully you avoid that by talking to colleagues and figuring out kind of what's good in your your neck of the woods, but you can get burned and it's better at that point to just cut your losses and sign a contract that's really not going to be tenable for you. Um, so once the application is submitted, you're in a weird limbo uh, period with patients. So patients that are coming to you during that period who have that insurance, um, you should operate under the assumption that they are still private pay uh, and paying your private pay rates until you get official word from the payer that you are in network. Now, what gets tricky is that some payers will arbitrarily backdate. So let's say I applied on January 1st for a payer and I saw patients January through March. Now, let's say at the end of March, the payer messages me and they said, congratulations, Dr. McMillan, you are now in network. And by the way, we've backdated this, not to January 1st when we submitted it, but February 20th. So any patients you saw from February 20th, to the end of March, if they were private pay, you have to refund them money. Um, so that's not great. Similarly, if you promised patients you were going to be in network and your contract date isn't until the end of March, then they're going to be really disappointed. So I always just am really upfront with patients if I'm going through this process. And sometimes I've even gone so far as to not charge them and just basically be like, look, I'm, I think I'm going to be contracted. I think it's going to get backdated. Let's just wait and see. And, you know, here's what will happen in scenario A. Here's what will happen in scenario B. Because I don't really like to be in the process of needing to refund money. I would much rather kind of be in, in a situation where um, I'm kind of waiting and seeing, but it's, you know, it's up to you and your, your circumstances as to what you, as to what you want to do, but be prepared for that. Um, once that contract is finalized, please, please, please sign up for electronic fund transfer right away so that you can get those checks directly deposited rather than checks in the mail or the weird scammy credit cards that you then have to pay a credit card fee to process. That's, that's the absolute worst. Please don't use those. Um, and then finally, once you are in that contract, you've signed, everything's good. That is when you enroll in a clearinghouse. So if your EHR has a clearinghouse or you're working with a biller, that clearinghouse, um, some of them require enrollment in order to um, be able to submit claims and or to be able to see the adjudication and the, the ERA to see how much money was, um, was posted. Um, so this is not really a big deal. Sometimes this is like instant or just takes a couple days. And it's really just a matter of like clicking some boxes, putting your NPI, like it's nothing like credentialing. It's really simple. The exception is Medicare it can take a couple weeks, but they really hold your hand through it. You just follow all the steps. And basically you're just saying, Hey, Medicare, this is my clearinghouse now. Yes. It's okay to submit information. That's it. So it's a lot, but that's what, that's what you have to do, which is on to my next question, which is if that sounded like a lot, it's because it it is. And it's definitely something you can do yourself, particularly if you're just kind of experimenting with just one or two pairs. However, if it's something that you're really uh, do not have time for, do not are worried about messing up, um, and you just really want to make sure this is done right the first time, you may wish to consider hire outsourcing this to a company that has experience with this. Um, most of these companies will um, either do just the credentialing part and sometimes state licensures as well. So if you wanted to get that main license or whatever else, you can do that. Um, or they will also take you on as a customer to do your full revenue cycle management, meaning they'll do all the claims processing, kind of all of it. Um, and some people want one or both of those. It's really up to your 
circumstances. For the credentialing, typically the price range that we're seeing is uh, low end 100, high end 250 per payer per clinician. Sometimes it's more for Medicare and Medicaid than a commercial payer. Um, so that's kind of the, if you're seeing something within that range, some people do hourly rates, but generally that's going to be the cost per, per payer. Um, so there is a pretty steep learning curve and it can save time to use one of these companies because they hopefully know what they're doing. Um, and you know, that's, that's definitely something that you'll have to decide for yourself. Similarly, like if you're in a large group practice, you're probably going to want to have someone either in-house that knows what they're doing or contract out because it just becomes an administrative burden to do this yourself. Um, you also, you know, need to see like, what does your EHR have? Does it do revenue cycle management itself? Um, some of them have packages already built in. Um, most, you know, most do not. Most just have the clearing house and then they expect you to either do the claims yourself or partner with a third party. Um, and that's, and that's fine. Um, a big decision point as to whether or not you want to do the full revenue cycle management outsource. Um, how complex are your claims? If you're just doing simple med management and therapy, honestly, the hardest part is the credentialing. It's not that hard to submit. Like once you know how to like lay out a claim and everything, it's really not that hard. Um, and they're going to be pretty straightforward in terms of the payment. Once you start getting into services that require prior authorizations, um, things like TMS, things like S-ketamine, um, or if you do like really extended therapy and need special coding for it, those are started when you start to be like, you know what, I like this is not going to go as planned. Like I need somebody to really work this kind of stuff. That's when you start to get into, okay, I need this RCM person. If you just have a huge volume of these things, you don't want to bother many payers outsource um, or hire someone in house who knows what they're doing. Um, typically, um, the cost uh, of those services is based on the amount of collection. So I've seen ranges from four all the way to up to 8.5 and sometimes even some high outliers. I would say if you're like less than 4%, you kind of get what you pay for and I'd be pretty skeptical. And if you're above 8.5%, they better be doing a like, really awesome job. So this is kind of the typical range and it really will depend on the needs of your practice, the volume, the complexity, et cetera. Um, so we do have a question, what are some good screening for screening questions when you're looking to sign up with a billing company? So I particularly like to find ones that are have some specialization in mental health. Um, in particular, if you're in the interventional space, do they have experience with those types of services? Um, getting references, definitely getting references is really, really important. Um, Sometimes people want to, you know, see is is it uh, using mainly offshore um, people? Is it is it, uh, um, you know, just in the United States? Like how how is that working? How do you know how do they like to work? Uh, what are their fees? What is their you know clean claim rate? All those kinds of stuff. But I really say like references goes a long a long way because they'll all kind of talk a good game, but the proof is going to be in the pudding. And then you know finally a lot of the really good ones like they just aren't taking new clients. So that's going to eliminate some of them right off the bat. You can ask them, you know, who they might recommend if they're, um, if they're full. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so in terms of negotiating, so before you do sign on that dotted line, um, you know, if this is kind of your first go around right out of the gate, you may just say, you know what, I'm just going to take these rates. And then in a year or two, I'm going to ask to renegotiate. And it really is important to renegotiate every couple of years. Um, but you want to make sure in your application that you're putting down things like, um, do you have special board certifications? Are there special services that you offer that are scarce in your area? Do you speak a different language? Um, do you have extended hours on nights and weekends? How soon can you see someone? Um, these are all questions that payers will look, look at to decide whether or not they should pay you more than the practice down the street. Um, it's great to have outcomes data. We don't have value-based care really meaningfully right now in behavioral health, um, but if you do happen to have so many outcomes data, you do measurement-based care, you track outcomes, great opportunity to show some of those outcomes, um, but don't think that you need to have that. Um, really, they're looking more at your credentials. Um, I've also used the technique of actually, so I'm a child psychiatrist. the directory and was able to demonstrate that within you know a 20 mile radius you know half the people were dead 
or only worked at a hospital and we're not taking any patients. Like if you can basically show them that they have a ghost network that no, no, no. And like that person's not a child psychiatrist. Like that's a family nurse practitioner. Like what is this, right? Like you'll actually start to show them like they don't have what they think they have in their network and that can help you negotiate. Um, the only downside of asking is that it will draw out the process a little bit lo longer. You can literally just cross out the rates and suggest a higher one. Um, and a way to do it across the board is to be like, I want to be paid, you know, 125% of the Medicare rate. Here's the Medicare rate. Here's where you're at. You're at 110%. Let's get, let's get to, you know, 125 um, and then like meet somewhere in the middle. So have some like rationale to why you picked a certain, uh, a certain number. Um, if you believe that you're going to be doing TMS at some point, it's important to ask right of the gate for those, con those codes. They're not always included. You can get them added later but you wanna make sure that they include um, everything that you're gonna need. If you are having a group practice and you have trainees or other types of people that are not uh, eligible to be credentialed, like for example, like an art therapist oftentimes is not eligible. Um, there is something called incident to billing, the details of which are beyond the scope of today. But basically, if you do have that situation, you really wanna figure out if that's gonna be workable with that payer and what the rules are before you sign. Sometimes you can get a rider, an addition on that contract to allow for those types of structures. So that's going to be a little bit more advanced. Um, and then finally, do read the contract. It's a lot of legal ease. Um, it's not something where you like, they're pretty standard. Like you don't need to hire an attorney to, to review it unless you're some massive, you know, enterprise level practice. But usually there's non-disclosure clauses um, around the fee schedule. So again, that idea that you can't just go and tell your friend what they're paying you. Um, unless your friend like works at your clinic. Um, so it's just, you don't want to run afoul of that. Um, so those are the terms. Um, we'll have a blog post coming out about this soon as well. Um, so getting set up to submit the actual claim. So almost there, almost ready to submit an actual claim. Um, so again, make sure you're enrolled with that clearinghouse for each payer. Um, as we said before, actual pictures of those insurance cards are key. Don't just get the number. Make sure that you're also asking in your workflow or your EHR is in this workflow, collecting demographics for the subscriber if that's not the patient. So that maybe their parent or spouse, and that includes their date of birth, their address, their phone number, all those good things, because those are going to end up on the claim. Um, and don't assume that people necessarily know what that means. So you sometimes have to do a little education. Um, be sure to set it up in your system to submit claims to the correct payer ID. Um, so there is like a weird quirk where Blue Cross Blue Shield, you actually always just submit to your local Blue Cross Blue Shield. Same with Medicare. Like they could have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Pennsylvania and you're in California. You're going to submit to the California Blue Cross. If you submit to the Pennsylvania one, it will get rejected. Why this is, I don't know, but this is how it is. Um, same with Medicare. They will process it through the sort of local one. Um, and somehow they do make their way to where they need to go ultimately, but that first pass has to be the local carrier. Um, you also wanna do some eligibility checking in your workflow. So that means you're gonna go onto a portal. Sometimes it's within the EHR clearing house. Oftentimes though, it's on a payer portal directory. And sometimes it maybe, maybe even means calling a payer depending on what services you're curious about. Um, so that will be looking, A, is this patient in network? Do they have an in-network deductible? What is their copay? What is their coinsurance? How much do you think they are going to owe? Um, and I usually say to the patient, like, look, I've checked. I think that it's going to be this. However, sometimes the information we get is not accurate. So we're never going to know fully what your insurance is going to do with this claim until we submit it. So don't make promises you can't keep. Um, I would love to say this information was always accurate, but it is not. So we always just have to go into it with that open eye and that will save misunderstandings um, down the road. Um, you can check at definitely at the start, definitely at January because uh, people's um, plans often reset then. Um, and then some people will check uh, before every session. Um, that really is a, a preference, how your practice runs, how your system runs. Um, it's probably not the most typical for the type of smaller practices that uh, we're talking about here, but um, you know, some people do do it and it's much more common like primary care and things like that. Um, 
Also, I think one thing to keep in mind for psychiatry in particular, mental health in particular, is like you may be only credentialed as we're talking about with like a couple plants, right? Unlike a primary care doctor who's credentialed with like everything, you're just a handful. So you'll see I've many times patients say to me, oh, by the way, doctor, you know, I'm, I've switched, I'm switching to Aetna. So just so you know, I'll send you my new card. And they don't understand at all that you're only in network with like one payer. So this is a really thing to tell people upfront um, that you're not necessarily going to be continuing to see them in network if their insurance changes. Um, and that is, that is just kind of the reality of our field right now, unless you're someone that's very widely paneled. Um, and that is going to be different than their experience with other healthcare. Um, you also, in your system, you can input your fee schedule amount. Um, so let's say, you know, the contract is for hundred, you can put a hundred for that payer, or some people will just put like a blanket private practice amount across the board. Um, and then, um, when it, the claim comes back, that's when you have to like write off, right? So you, you know, the rate isn't 200, but you just put 200 on the claim. You're going to have to write off a bunch. It's, it's kind of a stylist thing, an accounting thing. Um, as to which one you want to do. I typically recommend putting the actual rates if you do know them. And if you don't know them, putting those, um, just your blanket, like private practice rates. Uh, there is a, a risk where if you put what you think are your rates and your rates are actually higher, they'll only pay what you put. So you could get underpaid. So in particular, like you wanna make sure uh, annually for Medicare and if you get a new contract that you're updating that stuff because you certainly don't wanna leave money on the table that you're entitled to. Um, next slide. All right, so when you go to submit your claim, um, it, some people will really feel quite confident that they know what the copay is or the co-insurance and they'll charge that at the time of visit. Um, I typically will do this uh, once I've already processed at least one claim for that person. So I'm confident, okay, it's the, you know, it's the specialty copay or it's the primary care copay. Um, because I don't, again, don't like to get into the business of refunding or needing to charge more. I, I usually just kind of like to wait. The other um, alternative is to just fully wait until the claims uh, process back and get adjudicated. And then you know what you're charging is what it says in the, uh, in the insurance company. Um, make sure to finish the note. Um, do not submit a claim um, unless your note is fully signed and, and finalized. Um, most of the contracts say this needs to happen. Um, and if you submit a bunch of notes, a bunch of claims and don't have notes done for them, then it really technically gets into that insurance fraud area. And if they ever were to audit, they could say, hey, you know what, that note wasn't done. I know a, a famous hospital in Massachusetts had to give him back a lot of money because people were doing the notes, but they just were never signing them. And lo and behold, they get audited and they had to give all that money back. So don't let that be you, sign your notes. A good note is a done note. Um, you also wanna figure out, again, do you have a group practice contract? Do you have an individual contract? Because although you'll be building under your practice's tax ID, whether or not you bill under that type two um, group NPI or your individual one will depend on your contract. Um, when you submit a claim, you have to uh, pick diagnosis pointers. Usually in psychiatry, you really only need one and it's the first one that matters, the order matters. Um, you can put up to four, um, but specific services that have authorizations, oftentimes they're tied to a diagnosis. So a good example would be TMS. If I get a GMS off for depression and the patient has depression and ADHD, I can't have ADHD be the first diagnosis pointer. The claim will get rejected and maybe confused like I was for a long time until you figured out that depression had to be in the number one spot. So just a little, little pointer, don't do that. Um, figure out if you need any modifiers. Um, typically when you sign a contract, they'll tell you what modifiers you need for telehealth services. And then if you are somebody that's doing multiple services on the same day, there are modifiers for that. Um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of today, but um, just something to keep in mind if you're going into that territory, they typically won't pay for um, two mental health services on the same day without the use of modifiers. And even then they still might not. Um, if you've needed to get prior authorization, be sure to put that number on the form. If you have one on file and it's not on your claim, you will not get paid. Um, and then finally, there's a little box that uh, asks about the language depends on your system, but assigning benefits or accepting assignments. 
you want to check that box off in order for you to get paid. That basically means, hey, insurance company, pay me directly. If you don't check that box, the patient will receive the check instead of you. Now, if you want to submit things for out-of-network patients as a courtesy and they've already paid you, uncheck that box and then you can do that and they can get the check. But uh, it's very important for your own claims that you're expecting to get paid for that you check that box. Um, and finally, you know, you submit, you submit it, hopefully it scrubs it, hopefully it's clean. Usually when you're starting with a new payer, your clearing house, um, I usually like to just kind of check and make sure everything went, went through, um, double check like several hours later or the next day, just to make sure there aren't any weird errors because some things can get past the first step, but then get sort of held up later. Um, same with like, if it's a new patient, I might want to just make sure like, do I have like a working, it's like, do you have a working phone line? Like, is this working? Is this everything going as planned? And then for future claims, it's much easier. Um, couple of just pointers here, um, secondary coverage. So for Medicare claims, most people, they don't have, like, I usually say, if you have Medicare, do you have a copay when you come to visits? And they'll tell me, no, no copay. Okay, great. Then you have secondary coverage. And I don't even need to know what that secondary coverage is. Medicare will forward it on and several weeks to months later, you will get paid for the secondary coverage. Um, in the meantime, you may get something back that says like maybe the patient owes money, but usually it will say somewhere on there that the claim has been passed along to uh, an additional payer. Um, and finally, be mindful of timely filing rules. Um, usually it depends on the payer and their state rules but 90 to 180 days. Uh, if you are outside that window for submitting a claim, um, then you're not gonna get paid. Typical scenario that this happens in is you have the wrong coverage information and you're having to like go back in time when the patient said, oh, actually I had Aetna back then, not Blue Cross. You may be outside the window. Sometimes you can appeal, but kinda just, just submit them on time. Same day, same week, something like that. All right, next slide. Finally, getting paid, what everyone's been waiting for. Um, so a key thing here is like, you really are not supposed to waive co-pays or deductibles or co-insurance. These are issues here where you can see how businesses could undercut each other if they said like, hey, I'm waiving your co-pay, come see me, not someone else. That's insurance fraud, don't do that. Um, even if the patient is like, oh, I don't wanna pay, it's too much money. If they really do need, you need to make a, a really solid effort to, to pay and uh, collect that money. Um, there's going to be cases where, of course, you're just never going to be able to get that money despite your best efforts, and then you can write it off, but you don't want to get into the habit of doing this. Patients are really obligated to pay that. They have a contract with their insurance company as well, and when their insurance is paying you, they're expecting um, that, 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 you know, that that person is, is paying you as well. Um, so it's really just, just a necessary evil. Um, you can charge most people for no-shows or late cancels, but not Medicaid. If they have Medicaid primary or secondary, it's not allowed. Um, so most of the time people have policies around like several missed appointments. You can't be a patient here anymore, something like that, but no no-show fees. Remember, no balance fee billing. You cannot charge more than the contracted rate for services that the insurance has covered. Um, very, very important. Um, how soon are you going to get paid? This varies. I've seen it anywhere from like, I don't know, four or five days at the low end to weeks, hopefully not months. Um, so it's just, you're going to have to learn with each payer kind of what the norm is. And then if you see a claim that's not being paid within that norm, chances are something is wrong with that claim. Um, AR tracking, so accounts receivable tracking, so you're going to have in your system uh, typically ways to view uh, what claims are outstanding, how much is outstanding, how many days outstanding, like is it age 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. There are what's called prompt payment rules that vary by state, where if something is outside of, say, I'm just going to say 90 days, then the payer can actually be fined by the state um, for every day that they're late. Um, hopefully it's not getting to that point, but I have seen it happen. Um, it, it happens and that's where having a professional biller sometimes um, can can help and like in particular I was talking about like Medicaid like definitely having a professional biller when we were taking more Medicaid in my old practice was very very helpful because there were just like computer glitches and stuff that they had to deal with and it sometimes ran up against prompt payment um, deadlines. Um, 
you're going to want to look at that ERA to see what the patient owes once the patients come, the claims come back and either charge them or make sure you charge them the right thing in the first place. Um, you also want to check, did they pay a current, your current fee schedule? Strictly relevant if you're bringing on a new clinician who is credentialed somewhere else, are they paying that rate or your rate? Um, or if you just got a raise from the payer, are they paying your new rates? Oftentimes they're not. This happens more than you would think. And again, that's where having a professional biller to deal with it has, you know, has some advantages. Claim denials, what everyone doesn't want. It's called working the claim. It can be calling, resubmitting. This is the stuff that people really hate about taking insurance. And hopefully if you're doing more straightforward, you know, med management and therapy, you're not going to run into this. If you are an interventional psychiatrist, you are going to run into this. Um, and if you're really high volume, you'll run into this. So this is where it's really going to be something that you as a clinician practicing at the top of your license there do not want to spend time doing and really want someone whose job it is to do this, who knows how to work these systems, uh, handle this. Um, they will audit records. They will try to claw back money. It's, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole, a whole, a whole fiasco. Um, so wanted to just do a poll of what kind of worries you the most about working with insurance as we're kind of wrapping up. And hopefully you're feeling less worried about the talk today, but um, do, do want to kind of see where people's heads are at. Um, and then next slide. So just to plug in here um, with Ausline, our electronic health record is what I use in my practice, um, which again is interventional psychiatry and general psychiatry. Uh, we do have a claim solution. We work with Change Clearinghouse, which is one of the major, major, most modern claim, uh, clearinghouses in the country. Um, and it makes it really easy, just one-stop shop within the EHR. Highly recommend that you have a, a claim solution within your EHR. If you have a separate one, it's a lot of duplication of work and uh, really not worth it when you have solutions like this at your disposal. Um, you know, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, we do have one question. Um, so the question is, I can't refuse, I know I can't refuse to see patients who speak a different language. Is there a way to reduce the cost burden of this on my practice? If this were to happen a lot, my practice would have to close. So it's a little bit beyond the scope of, um, you know, of this. There, there are pretty strict rules around interpreter services, and there are more low-cost ones out there. Um, but my understanding is there really isn't a lot uh, within commercial carriers to deal with this. Um, but um, you know, there, there definitely are. You know, I would say that's more of a, a rule in general, sort of independent of insurance, um, more of an ODA thing. Um, so I would check more specifically with with kind of those rules. Um, so let's see what people are most worried about. So it seems like far and away, people are worried about that our friendly insurance clawback uh, due to insurance company issues. I actually dressed as a cat who was an insurance company clawback last year for Halloween. So it is what we fear. Um, and that is something where if you're getting a lot of those things, it may be time to have a professional biller helping you out. Um, if you get like, I got one of these recently saying that the rate was covered in the surgical procedure. We were like, wait, what? What surgical procedure? What are you talking about? And again, that's like time someone has to spend calling, fixing it. Um, but it does, it does happen. Um, people are not scared of getting in trouble with Medicare, Medicaid. Just be a little scared. Fear and take those. Make sure you know what you're doing. Um, and credentialing and contracting. Sarah, did we do that other poll about credentialing and contracting? If not, we could we could launch that one real quick. A um, lot of questions about credentialing and contracting are normal. Um, if you are uh, skittish at all about hesitant, there are great services out there. Um, you know, it's like I said, the pricing is not that high, and it may be worth um, you know worth the headache. So, last question, just to kind of see where people's heads are at around revenue cycle. Um, we will be sending this talk out along with some additional resources. Um, and for those of you who are Osmine customers, happy to continue this discussion in our Osmine practice community as well. So let's see, Ken, we'd love to see the results for this one. And then thank you everybody for sticking with me and visiting the wild world of insurance. So yeah, it looks like a lot of you are like basically kind of split, like looking to handle this yourself or actually looking at to outsource. Um, there is no right or wrong answer. It really depends on your on your circumstances. Um, so I wish you all the best in your insurance journeys. And if it's not for you, that's fine too, but hopefully you'll find a way to work with insurance like I have over the years that works for your specific practices purposes. All right, thank you everyone for joining. And if you are interested in learning about more about Osmine, head on over to our website and you can sign up for our demo. Thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.